you how to restore your driver's license and resolve ticket. This webinar is sponsored by Texas Appleseed, the Earl Carl Institute, and the Texas Fair Defense Project. My name is Sarah Guidry, and I'm the Executive Director for the Earl Carl Institute for Legal and Social Policy at Texas Southern University's Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Today we will be talking about an issue that is important to thousands of Harris County residents. Participants will be able to ask questions via Facebook Live and Zoom. This program will guide you through how to restore your license and introduce you to policies to address license suspension. This is a time of reckoning with social injustice that requires that practices that drive minorities into the criminal justice system be especially scrutinized. One of those issues is the misuse of fines and fees that cities and counties use to generate revenue that weighs heavily on black communities. It also holds, it also provides holds on driver's license from Houston Municipal Courts and Harris County Justice of the Peace Court that place black residents' licenses on hold as a high, at a higher rate as twice their representation in the city. Approximately five in 10 of people arrested for driving while their license is invalid or black. The odds of being arrested by you driving with your license while invalid are more than five times higher for black individuals than white individuals in Houston. It is even more urgent that we remove these barriers to employment given the economic crisis we're currently undergoing created by the Corona virus pandemic. We know that unemployment in Houston is skyrocketing. And I will note that while COVID-19 pandemic has led to job losses in many sectors, there have been increases in jobs related to delivery services for which a driver's license is required. This is your time to call for reform and to save ourselves and fellow citizens from the hardships of poverty, increased debt, decreased opportunities for employment, the trauma of open warrants and arrests, as well as resulting criminal records due to not having a driver's license. This clinic will explain how to deal with outstanding tickets and how to get your license restored, as well as policies that will reduce the burdens created by this endless cycle. The agenda for today is first you will hear personal stories of an impacted family. You will then be provided with an overview on driver's license suspension. We'll talk about resolving fines and fees, policy and data, goals for Texas, and finally, a call for action. First person who will be speaking is a mother whose son was caught in this vicious cycle. Sandra Guidry, tried to help her son get his license restored for over seven years, during which he was only able to work sporadically and spend time in jail on more than one occasion. Ms. Guidry, would you please share your experience? Yes, uh, and thank you all for having me here today. Uh, when I had heard about the seminar, it just brought the feelings, uh, our family's feelings, the personal feelings back up again, and. The, the emotional toll that it had taken uh, about seven years for uh, my son to actually reinstate himself and get his license. Uh, to begin with, the tickets started rolling in and uh, he wasn't able to pay them. Uh, he was working odd jobs, uh, he really couldn't get a good job because of the suspended uh, driver's license. Uh, so uh, he and I would go back and forth, uh, me driving him back and forth to work. Uh, and it just really took a toll uh, on myself uh, in our relationship. Well, ultimately, uh, we started uh, to apply for the indigent care, uh, the hearing, uh, so that they would help him to pay the fines and to get his license reinstated. Um, and so when they began working with us, uh, we found out uh, that uh, he, uh, he had sat out some tickets, uh, fines, and didn't really owe a fine. 
and was just baffled that, you know, they, they wouldn't give him his driver's license. Well, uh, he had had tickets and fines in another county. And so we started all over again uh, with the other county, getting them uh, together, getting the tickets paid. And ultimately, uh, he was able uh, to get the tickets paid and fines paid. Uh, but be, and then uh, they stopped him again, and, and he was arrested with my grandson in the car. And oh, here we go again. And so it was just a vicious cycle of back and forth and going back and forth up to the, uh, the, the DPS. And they're not very friendly up there. Uh, and it, it was just really an emotional toll. Uh, well, finally, uh, we were able to uh, get the tickets uh, uh, taken care of uh, through uh, one of the programs. Uh, and, um, but then he had to go and take a driver's test all over again and uh, start from scratch. And so uh, then once uh, they did that, the program, the suspended program came in. We went to apply again to get his license, and then he had to pay a reinstatement fee. And so that was $100. And boy, I tell you, I just, I just almost hit the, hit the roof, almost lost it. But finally, we were, uh, we were uh, determined. He was able to finally get his, uh, his driver's license reinstatement uh, about uh, four months ago, and he finally uh, was able to get a good job. Uh, but through determination and prayer, I would say, probably, uh, it was just, it was a process. Thank you, Ms. Goodry. Um, we're going to move on to the next portion, which is the uh, details about how to restore your license and resolve your ticket. Um, the, the next presenter is Carly Jo Dixon. She is a author along with Texas Appleseed of a recently released report entitled Driven by Debt Houston. That report details this problem. Ms. Ms. Dixon is the managing attorney of client services at Texas Fair Defense Fund. I'm sorry, she is the managing attorney of client services at Texas Fair Defense Project. She's a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and the University of Texas School of Law. She came to work for the Texas Fair Defense Project as an Equal Justice Works Fellow in 2016, working with their criminal debt, criminal justice debt initiative. Using direct representation, community education, advocacy, and volunteer legal clinics, Carly Jo, who works to stop courts from incarcerating people who cannot afford to pay for their classic tickets and related fees, helps people facing this unaffordable debt avoid warrants, arrests, jail time, and driver's license suspension. So I will turn it over to Carly Jo, attorney Carly Jo Dixon. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Sandra, for uh, sharing the story of you, um, what you and your family have been through. I know for folks who are watching this, uh, who may be in this exact situation, uh, the cycle that is created from unpaid legal fees, including tickets um, and related driver's license suspensions can feel overwhelming. Our hope today, next slide, um, with this presentation um, and with this new toolkit uh, that you can find at tickethelptexas.org, uh, you will be able to start the process of resolving your fines and fees um, and getting back on the road. Uh, taking the steps to get your driver's license, the holds and suspensions lifted, um, and get your driver's license reinstated. As we move through this presentation today, please ask questions um, in the chat boxes that are available to you, either through Facebook Live or if you're logged into a Zoom. Um, but just know that we can't ask, really answer questions that are about your specific um, legal situation um, because it's gonna, everyone's legal situation is gonna be different um, so keep your questions general if you can, and we'll have some time at the end um, to hopefully get to them. Next slide. So we are going to start with trying to give you the tools to answer the question, why is your driver's license suspended? 
Uh, in theory, that should be a really easy question. There should be one place you could go to figure it out, um, but there isn't. And so we're gonna walk through uh, the various places and websites uh, where you can look to figure out what's going on with your driver's license, what do these holds mean, um, and how do we start to resolve them. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do, I'm going to call it three searches, um, but the last one might have um, a couple of different places that you go. So we're going to search uh, through DPS's license eligibility system, uh, the failure to appear or pay. We sometimes call this OmniBase or Omni. Um, so I mentioned that here, um, if I talk about the Omni search, uh, this is what I'm talking about, and we will go into detail uh, how to make that search uh, with your driver's license and your date of birth um, and what the information you find means. Um, and then we'll talk about how to both search for the courts where you have tickets in, um, and then how do you contact that courts? How do you contact the courts um, and then ask for uh, what you need when you cannot afford to pay your tickets outright. Right. And we'll talk. So the first search we are going to do um, or talk through is the DPS license eligibility search. Um, this one you can find through Google. We've got the URL up right now, but if you just search DPS license eligibility, it will get you there. You can also find a link to this search in the toolkit. So on the left side of the toolkit, there is a whole bunch of different topics. Um, and one of those topics is, I can't renew my driver's license. If you click on that topic, this search will be one of the hyperlinks in there, uh, and you can go and search through that. You're gonna need a couple of things though to make this search. You're gonna need your driver's license number and your state ID number if you have a state ID. I always recommend searching under both because the state of Texas does not always merge your state ID and your driver's license number accounts. So they can have very different information, even though they're both connected to you uh, through your date of birth and the last four digits of your social security number. Some folks will say, but I don't know my driver's license number or my driver's license is suspended. That number is the same, even if it's suspended. Um, and you may have to call DPS, which may take you an afternoon um, and see if they can get you that number. They will not send it to you, give it to you over the phone, but they will email it to you um, if you don't know what that number is. The information we're gonna find on this, on this uh, report, it's gonna help guide the rest of your work. And so when you open it up, there are a lot of words on there um, and not all of the words are important. Um, so we're gonna go through the main places to look and what is important. And so the first thing we're gonna look for is the status. And your status can only be one of two things. It can be eligible or not eligible. And I've got a little screenshot um, right here at the bottom of this slide. Um, and that's exactly, it's a screenshot from the report. And we can see that this person's driver's license is currently not eligible. That means that there is some sort of suspension or hold on their driver's license that means they can't go get a regular driver's license. And so let's look through what some of those suspensions and holds could be. So the first place we're gonna look is the next big heading and it is called an enforcement action. And these can include time suspensions. So, you know, a start date and an end date. These are usually in either one year, two years or 90 day increments. Um, it could include a requirement that you take a drug education class. Um, if you've ever had any sort of conviction um, for a drug related offense, there might be a requirement that you get a certain kind of car insurance called SR22 insurance. And then there are a handful of other ones that are just not quite as common. These are gonna be in a grid um, and you'll be able to look and see uh, which ones you have that apply to you. You may have none or you may have 10. Um, it's gonna vary wildly uh, based on your individual circumstances. Um, and so let's look at a couple of the common ones. So here we see some examples and I'm gonna walk through this first one. It says it's a mandatory suspension for driving while licensed and valid. And we see it's got a begin date and an end date. And that end date is a real number. Um, so if you have a time suspension like this, they can be called mandatory or departmental. Um, you can't drive illegally during this time, um, and there's no way to undo it. You have to wait it out. You may be able to apply for an occupational driver's license, 
We're gonna set that aside from now. I will talk more about that later. Um, underneath that is another kind of suspension. It's called a deny issuance of a driver's license. Um, it's got a start date, but then its end date is a little weird. Its end date is 12-31-9999, which basically isn't a real date, um, which means when you see something like that that ends in the 9999, um, that you have to do something in order to lift the suspension. It's different than a time suspension. You don't have to do anything to lift it. The time's gonna run. But in order to lift this suspension, you actually have to do something. Um, in the case of a de deny issuance type of suspension, you would need to call DPS. Um, and they conveniently uh, list the number of the driver's license customer service right here in the report for you to call them. So as I mentioned before, you may have a requirement that you take a drug education class. Any drug-related conviction um, includes this requirement. You could have two convictions within a year, and it would pop up as two requirements. You only have to take the class one time. Um, and you can see this suspension also has that 9999 end date, which means it is indefinite. It is forever um, until you take that class. Uh, these classes are normally offered by probation departments, um, and you can often get a fee waiver if you cannot afford to pay the class. Another common suspension on people's driver's license is what's called an SR suspension. This happens for a variety of reasons, but it's almost always related to not having car insurance, whether that's a ticket for not having car insurance, or you were in a fender bender and you didn't have car insurance, so you got pulled over for DWI and you didn't have car insurance, there are a lot of ways you can end up with this kind of suspension. Uh, once again, it's got that 9999 end date, which means you have to do something. And in this case, you have to get SR22 car insurance. And many people have never heard of SR22. It is a certificate that is sent directly to uh, DPS and it just proves that you have car insurance. And so if you have this hold on your license, you'll need to contact an SR22 provider. Most insurance companies provide it. Um, and you'll need to get that special certificate, which often costs between 25 and $40 more than regular liability insurance a month, um, but can cost significantly more um, if your situation is complicated. So I recommend if you have this hold on your license, uh, call around, call three, four, five different places um, because what it costs can vary wildly um, and it's worth checking to see if there is a way to get this um, in your price range so that you can lift this hold on your driver's license. So there's another place as we move down this report um, that shows that there may be tickets and not everyone once again is going to have this that are creating a hold on the renewal of your driver's license. And so we see it says other requirements, and then it says you have outstanding citations under the failure to appear, failure to pay program. And I mentioned that earlier. We also call it Omnibase. They mention it there too, Omnibase services. Um, and until you do that, you can't renew your driver's license. So if your driver's license has not expired yet, it can still be valid. It can still show eligible, but you may have this popping up because you've got some tickets that you need to resolve. And so we're going to, um, in a minute, look at the search to see where are those tickets from that are holding up my driver's license. And then we're gonna talk through how do, I, how do I contact those courts and how do I start dealing with them. So the last thing that I wanna note, um, and uh, Sandra in telling her story, her son's story, noted that there are often reinstatement fees. These are fees that are in addition to um, any fines or court costs you might have to pay related to the tickets. They're paid directly to DPS. Uh, there is no program currently uh, to reduce or waive these fees and they do not take payments. Uh, they also only accept payment online or through the mail. And so paying these fees can be a little complicated. You've got to get all the money together at once um, and then you have to mail it or have access to a computer and a credit card to pay it online. Um, these fees are often the only thing keeping folks from being able uh, to actually go and renew or get a copy of their driver's license. 
So we're going to move on. Uh, that was a lot of information that all can be found um, in your driver's license eligibility report with DPS. And everyone's report is going to be a little bit different because it's based on your individual situation. I say that because people sometimes log in and they say, I don't have any reinstatement fees or I don't have any, you know, of these other holds um, or I have more than you mentioned and just know um, that it can look very different. One of the things we saw in that report was that being entered in the failure to appear pay program, also called OmniBase, can put a hold on the renewal of your license. And so if you have that hold on the renewal of your license, you're gonna to wanna to figure out what courts have placed that hold. And so you can go to texasfailuretoappear.com. Uh, this search is a little simpler. You just need your driver's license and your state ID, if you have a state ID, and your date of birth. Like, once again, I recommend searching under both, just in case DPS has not merged your accounts. Uh, you can also find a link to the texasfailuretoappear.com in the toolkit. Um, it is listed on that same toolbar on the le left under, I need to resolve OmniBase holds. So click that link. Um, it will walk you through doing that search, but it'll also walk you through some of the things we're talking about today. Um, so what are these? So you can get entered into this program if you fail to appear in court. So if you receive a traffic ticket uh, and then you just don't do anything, um, they may put your driver's license into this program. And, or maybe you go to court and you get on a payment plan and you can't keep up with it. Uh, when you fail to keep up with that payment plan or maybe it's community service, uh, the court might put you into this program as well. Uh, for failure to pay. It uh, places a hold on the renewal of your driver's license. So like I said, if your license hasn't expired yet, you may have these holds sort of pending, but they don't kick in until your driver's license expires. And so what happens is they also come with a fee. Um, if it was before September of last year, the fee is $30. Um, the fee is now $10 for new holds. Um, the, the legislature sort of pushed around uh, the different fees. And so this fee has been reduced, but if it is old, which the majority of them in Texas are, um, it's still that full $30 fee per ticket or offense entered in. So if you got pulled over for no driver's license, but you also got a ticket for no insurance and for speeding and for not wearing your seatbelt, and all of those tickets ent were entered into the Omni system, uh, your fees would be $120. Uh, that is in addition to um, any other fees or fines related to the actual ticket. Uh, most courts keep these holds on place until the underlying charge is resolved completely, uh, which means that they don't usually lift them just because you appear in court. They don't usually lift them just because you enter into a payment plan. They usually wait all the way to the end, um, which could be months um, or maybe even years. If you were given 120 hours of community service, it may take you a year to do it. Um, and a lot of courts will keep those holds on there the entire time. Uh, we recommend that you ask whenever you go to court, whenever you write a letter, and we'll talk about this more later, um, you ask them to lift this hold um, because you are showing a good faith effort uh, to deal with your tickets. So once we've logged in, I've got a little screenshot up there um, of you know, a uh, Omnibase report. And so we can see this person has two tickets. Uh, they're in Travis County JP2. We can see the docket or the cause number. Uh, this is a number that the court uses to identify the ticket. And when you contact the court, you'll want to include that number. Uh, when the offense happened, a description, this particular description tells you what the charges were. They don't always. This uh, description is routinely blank in these reports. And then it also has an amount due. This is the amount due when the uh, cases were entered into Omnibase. As many of y'all know, if you have tickets uh, that have gone on for a long period of time, the amount you owe balloons, it gets bigger. With every warrant, um, you know, there's a new fee. And so um, the amount due is not always real. It's the amount due when they entered them into the system, but if time has passed, um, the court may have on record that you owe even more than is listed here. So you can also search local courts. 
Um, I've got a couple of, you know, real Austin, Travis County courts here. Uh, the city of Austin, it's called the Austin Municipal Court. Um, there's also a Houston Municipal Court. Um, almost all the cities have a municipal court. They also have justices of the peace. Um, this is the website to look for the tra under the Travis County justices of the peace. Um, Harris County has, I forget, more than 10 justices of the peace. Um, and each one is different. So if you have a ticket in Bastrop County JP1, a judge in Bastrop County JP3 can't help you with that ticket. And I say that because it can be confusing. The courts sound very similar, um, but each one is different. And so just know that if you are searching to see which justices of the peace you may have tickets in, um, just know that they're very different. And so make sure to note that number um, and to know that what happens in number two is gonna be different than what happens in number three, and that the judge in number two can't do anything about number three. Um, this is true of all of the courts. Uh, routinely people say, I went to court and the judge waived everything. Well, a judge can only waive stuff that happened in their court. And so this is why you may, if you have tickets in five places, um, you're going to have to contact five different courts. Um, but we are going to walk through that um, and hopefully give you some tools to make that a little easier. So one more thing before we move on to what we should do, which is you may be able to find yourself online with your name and your date of birth and see that you have tickets um, or log in to the Omnibase report and see that you have unpaid tickets, but you don't really know what's going on. Um, if you don't really know what's going on, it is okay. You can call the court and ask. Uh, you can send them an email. If they use email, in the last, since the pandemic started in March, um, so many more courts have email addresses and are using email to get their work done. And so that may be one of the only good things to come out of this pandemic is, is some courts it's easier to contact them. So contact the court. It's also important to note that there is no statewide database of tickets or warrants. And so I just walked through um, a database of some of them, but if the court does not send your ticket to the Omnibase system, it's not gonna appear there. And so you may remember getting pulled over somewhere um, you may have to do some sleuthing. You may need to be like, all right, I was on this stretch of the highway. I think it's in this county. Is it in a city? You may have to call five or six, court, six courts um, before you can find that ticket. Um, there's no one place to look and figure out, you know, all the tickets you may have outstanding. So let's talk through, and this really is in some ways the most important part of this presentation and of the toolkit. Once you know what's going on, you figured it out, you looked through the different reports related to your driver's license, you figured out where your outstanding tickets are, um, you're gonna have to contact the courts. There is no way around it. Uh, these tickets, I put never in here, never go away. It should say very rarely. Time does not make them go away. People routinely contact my office and they say, I can't drive legally, I don't know why. And I'm like, oh, well, you have a ticket. It's from 2006. And they say, but that's so far in the past. And I have to tell them, well, in the court, it's in the present. They, if you, they don't care how much time has passed. Um, if nothing has happened in the ticket, it is still there. Um, they're still waiting for you to do something. Uh, when you contact the court, it can and should be in writing. If you call a court on the phone, they may not write down that you called. Um, and there may be no proof that you have attempted to resolve your ticket. So always contact the courts in writing. Uh, that can be a mail. That is the most common way is to send them a letter. And once again, it could be an email. Uh, for courts that use email, uh, sending them an email may be an easy way uh, for you to contact them and for them to have a record that they have been contacted and something to forward to the judge. We will talk about the different people who work um, in each court and what their role is. But if you call the court, and you talk to a clerk, that clerk's not necessarily going to tell the judge you called, and the judge is the person you need to talk to in order to do anything on your cases. Uh, you'll also need to enter a plea. Um, the pleas, these are criminal cases. The pleas can be not guilty, guilty, or no contest. And we'll talk through the various pleas um, and what they might mean for you or your individual situations, 
But just know that, you know, these are criminal cases, even though they're in theory only fines. We all know that you can and people do go to jail for them. Um, but just think through those plea options. And then if you can't afford to pay your ticket, uh, you've got to ask the court for help. And we're going to talk about what the options are and what that help can look like. For all of the options, which we're getting to, there are sample letters in the toolkit. And so when you go and you think, all right, I'm ready to contact the court, I've decided what I want to ask them for, um, go pull a letter from there that will help, it'll guide you in writing that letter or that email, um, and it'll have more detailed instructions. So in these letters, you want to always include what you're asking for. Um, we're gonna talk about the different things you can ask for here in a minute. Um, a statement of inability to pay. That is just, it's like a, a form that has your financial situation, your dependents, whether you're getting government benefits, and you just say, I can't afford to pay my tickets. You always wanna send either the general one that we have in the toolkit, or if the court has a specific application, you can send that one. You know, a judge cannot evaluate your ability to pay your tickets or your eligibility for other options uh, if you don't tell them what's going on. I always, in that letter, want to also put an explanation of your financial situation. Tell them why you're struggling right now. Don't just have them read the numbers. You know, make yourself into a person when they read them and they hear a story. We talked in the beginning how stories are powerful. And this letter, when you write to them, is your chance to tell your story. Uh, to the judge, you know, and ask them to see you as a person, not just as an unpaid ticket. Also send them proof, proof of your government benefits you or your dependents receive, proof of any medical conditions or other reasons that you can't do community service. Uh, give them as much paperwork as possible so they can make that decision. The court may get your letter and they just may agree to what you want and then send you something in the mail um, or they may set you in hearing. Right now, some of those hearings are in Zoom uh, some of those hearings are in pause. And so if they need a hearing, they will also let you know. They're usually going to do that in the mail or by email, depending on what you did. So make sure you've got an address that they can get a hold of you listed in your letter. Um, if you don't know if a court has a specific financial application, ask them. Send them an email. It says, I can't afford to pay my tickets. Uh, do you all have an application or can I just send one? Um, they'll usually send you back an application for you to fill out. So there are two different sort of ways you can have tickets. One can be you've never been to court, you've never agreed to pay your tickets, um, you've never been to jail on your tickets, you didn't see a judge in jail where maybe they took a plea from you, um, and you have all the options available, not guilty, no contest or guilty. Um, if you want to fight the ticket, um, you're going to have to enter a not guilty plea, and they're going to set you a court date. You're gonna do this once again in writing, in the mail or over email. Uh, you're gonna to have to be prepared to go to court. Could be Zoom court right now. It could be real court right now as well or sometime in the future. But if you wanna fight it, it is not guilty. Um, at this first court date, it won't be a trial. You may get to a trial, but you're gonna sit down with the prosecutor and you're gonna talk about how to resolve the ticket. So when you talk to the prosecutor, there are several ways that you could resolve a ticket. They could offer you a deal, something like deferred disposition or driving safety course, uh, something that usually includes some sort of unsupervised probation, and then at the end of it, they dismiss the ticket. Um, some courts will do community service or waiver instead of the fee that's usually associated with it. Uh, some won't. When you sit down with the prosecutor, let them know what you want, um, that you're trying to avoid a conviction, um, and that you can't afford to pay the fee and just ask them how the court handles the situation. Uh, you also might get the case dismissed outright. Uh, I would show up, if you can, with the issue fixed. If it was a headlight, get your headlight fixed, bring a receipt, uh, bring your new car insurance that you have now, um, and just explain to the prosecutor how you fix the issue or why you're not guilty, um, and see if you can get them, convince them uh, to agree to dismiss the ticket outright. Uh, you might also get convicted. Uh, you may agree to get convicted. You may, the prosecutor may say, you've got four tickets. I will dismiss these three if you agree to community service on the fourth one. And you may say, you know what, that's a really good deal for me. And you may decide to do that. Uh, there can be other consequences for a conviction though. And so you've got to be careful. 
if you are convicted of driving without a valid driver's license, DPS is going to resuspend your driver's license. And so you may want to avoid being convicted on any sort of driver's license related offense. Uh, if you get convicted two times in your entire life of not having insurance, that requirement for SR22 is going to kick in. And so you may want to think about um, if a conviction is worth it, if it's going to have sort of other consequences, uh, like an additional suspension period. You may go into court, want to fight your ticket, and not be able to work out a deal with the prosecutor, um, in which case they're going to ask you, what kind of trial do you want? And you'll have the ability to go either before a judge or a jury. You know, a jury is made up, in theory, of, of you know, people just like you, um, and plead your case to them. Uh, this can be a little scary or intimidating, um, but just know that if, if you want a trial, it is your right uh, to ask for one and then to have one. Uh, sometimes the court, you will call the court clerk and they will say, you missed court, you have a warrant, and we want a bond. If that is true, um, a bond usually involves money. You should, you know, ask the clerk if the judge will take a personal bond, which is where you swear you'll come to court and let them know that you cannot afford to pay a bond. Um, there are examples of what a personal bond, uh, which is a promise for you to come to court looks like um, in the toolkit. And so I just wanna note that there, it is happening less and less because the law has gotten better um, in this area, but it still happens where folks call the clerk and the clerk just says, no, you can't come to court. And so just know that that no um, isn't always final. Um, should you say you're guilty? Sometimes people are like, I'll just plead guilty. And this is, I talked about a little bit before, there could be other consequences. Um, if you get a new driver's license suspension because you pled guilty, uh, you may need to get an occupational driver's license. This is a special needs license. It allows you to drive when your license is otherwise suspended. You do have to go to a court. A judge has to order it before DPS gives it to you. And so this is its own process. We're not gonna get into the details here. Um, but just know there is a section on occupational driver's licenses um, in the toolkit. Um, if you need one of these because you have a time suspension, uh, look at that and see if, it, if it's something that's right for you um, and that you're going to be able to do. Um, so more of the consequences of um, pleading guilty could be an increase in your insurance premiums or like I said earlier, you have to get that SR22. Um, it may affect job or housing. Uh, there are some things that are Class C's, like possession of drug paraphernalia, that look like drug offenses. Um, and if you plead guilty to them, they may pop up later um, in ways um, that you didn't anticipate. But like I said, sometimes the prosecutor is going to offer you something that sounds really good and get, gets rid of a lot of your cases, and it might be the right choice for you. So let's talk through what if you already pled guilty? And I ask a lot of people, have you pled guilty? The court said you pled guilty. And they say, I don't remember doing it. Well, this can happen if you make a payment, if you request a payment plan, you see a judge in jail. Um, it's not always very formal. So it's possible you've already pled guilty uh, to the offenses. Um, and sometimes there's already a warrant for failure to pay. Um, I, I mentioned here that it's called a capious pro fine um, in case a court tells you that. So you hear those words, you know, okay, that's a warrant for failure to pay. Next slide. Um, if you have already pled guilty, um, or if you decide to plead guilty, there are several options. The options are jail credit. This is if you have spent time in jail since the ticket issued. We are not advocating you go back to jail. We're trying to avoid you going to jail. Um, but if you've spent some time in custody, if you are picked up on the warrant uh, for these tickets, uh, send the court a letter um, that says, hey, you know, I went to jail and I, I'd like to receive jail credit for this. It's up to the judge whether they give it to you, um, but you can ask for it. You can also ask for a payment plan uh, in your letter and there are sample letters um, in the toolkit. Uh, please go there once you've figured out what you need um, and use those letters. But what can you afford? You know, make sure you put in, I can only afford $20 a month if that's what you want. Uh, don't let the court decide for you how much you're gonna pay. Uh, community service, that is work for a nonprofit, a government agency, um, sometimes a church, depending on the court, it can be going to rehab, it could be getting your GED. There are a lot of options for community service. And so also uh, put in where you want to do your community service. 
if that's what you want, or waiver. If you cannot afford the ticket and you have a reason why you cannot do community service without hardship, you're gonna write a letter and, and ask for a waiver of that ticket and the, and the money due. So I wanna talk briefly about the differences in who is in the court. Um, routinely, you will call the court, you will get a clerk on the phone. And this happens all the time. People call and they said, I called the court and the clerk told me the only thing that we can do is pay it. That's it. There's no other options. Well, that is never true. There are other options. And so clerks, they're the people who answer the phones. They cannot give you legal advice. And they don't even believe, some of them, that they can tell you that there are other options besides payment. Make sure that they understand that you're asking about indigency um, options, which is a fancy way to say that you can't afford to pay it, and the procedures. And so it might look like you calling them, they say, yeah, you've got three tickets, you owe $1,000. And you say, well, I can't afford to pay those tickets, and I'd like to know how I speak to the judge about those tickets. Um, at that point, they should say, oh, we've got a, we've got a financial packet. You know, can I get your email address and send it to you? And so uh, they are one person. The next person is the prosecutor. Uh, the prosecutor, you're only going to see more than likely if you plead not guilty um, and you go to that first court date to meet with them. Um, it's important to remember they are not your lawyer. They are the city's lawyer or the county's lawyer. Um, they have some discretion, like we talked about. They can offer you a deal, and that deal could include dismissing some of your tickets. Um, but they're limited in what they can do. If the judge does not allow community service for deferred disposition, which is that unsupervised probation that can lead to a dismissal, they may not be allowed to offer it. Um, they may not offer options that don't include payment. Uh, let them know that you can't afford to pay the ticket. Um, and that you're going to want to talk to the judge about your financial situation and see if y'all can work something out. But make sure they know um, about your financial situation so that they are acting with the same information that you have. The next person, and this is a person with all the power in a courtroom, is the judge. Um, they cannot speak to you um, unless you've pled no contest or guilty, so, or you're having a trial. Um, and they're not really speaking to you at the trial. Um, they can't just discuss your tickets with you. And people routinely want to come in and they see a judge and the judge might ask for their plea and they say, can I tell you what happened? And a judge can't really hear what happened until later if you go to trial or if you've you know, pled guilty or no contest. They may take that into consideration when they're figuring out the punishment, in this case, the fine or the community service. Um, they are the people who are supposed to evaluate your financial situation, your ability to pay these tickets. And so if you have a hearing, uh, based on your ability to pay, it'll be in front of the judge. So I do, I've talked about this a little bit throughout, but the world is weird right now. I know we all feel it. It's affecting our lives in different ways. It is affecting these courts as well. Um, the court operations are in constant flux. They are continuing to evolve and are often different day to day. Some of the courts are open, meaning you can go into the court you can request a hearing in front of the judge. You can request, um, you can plead not guilty and request you know, a meeting with the prosecutor and you can go into the court and do it with masks and social distancing, but some of them are open. Some of them are closed. Some of them you cannot get in the doors and when you call them, no one answers. Um, and some of them are on Zoom. If you contact them, they'll, they'll set you up with a, with a virtual hearing. Um, you can check the court's websites um, and figure out see if you can figure out what's going on. Uh, I still recommend calling, um, but this is one of the main reasons that we are recommending you mail or email right now. One, so it's in writing, so there's documentation of what's going on, um, but also because they're gonna get that mail and it may be delayed, you know, when, when a judge, you know, gets your request, but they're eventually gonna get it and they may be able to, you know, resolve your tickets without you ever having to come to court. Uh, you should mail and e or email as many documents as you can. In addition to the letter we talked about, you know, that has that request with what you want, whether it's, you know, to fight your ticket or jail credit or a payment plan or community service or waiver, um, include that and then as many documents that sort of show your situation. I try to get them so many documents that there's no way they could say no. Like no human being could look at 
all the documents and say no to whatever I'm asking for. So think about what they can be. Um, you know, your medical information might be confidential. Um, but, you know, thinking about could you get a letter from your doctor that just says you can't do community service without telling them what's going on uh, specifically. Um, and so think through those sorts of paperwork. Government benefits are really great to include to show you or your kids, you know, get SNAP or food stamps or free school lunches, uh, or you live in subsidized housing. All of that is going to be real useful uh, for the judge to evaluate your financial situation. Uh, if you get to the place and you have cleared your license, you're showing eligible, you have paid that reinstatement fee, you are ready to go to DPS, just know you have to make an appointment right now. There are no walk-ins available. Um, you can Google around and just see you know, how, to, um, how to schedule that appointment. They are far into the future, um, you know, a month or more out. Um, they are not, it is slow. It was slow in good times. It's even slower right now. But just know that's possible. Also, if you are showing eligible, you may be able to renew online, and it is worth checking and see if you can avoid going to DPS entirely. So just a couple of final tips um, before we turn it over uh, to talk about, you know, some policy stuff and, you know, how we can make the laws better um, for folks um, who are struggling to avoid, uh, afford to pay uh, these fines and costs. Um, always ask the judge to waive the court costs. And I, I, it's, this can be tricky because the fine is the punishment for the offense. And the court costs are just that. They're just extra costs. And so it may be possible to get a partial waiver of the court costs and then just do community service or payment plan on the fines. Um, so always ask for the court costs to be waived. Um, and always ask for those omni fees and holds to be lifted off your driver's license. If you don't ask, the judge for sure won't do it. Um, and if you ask, they might do it on the front end. And so it's worth asking on both of those things. Um, I also want you to be realistic. It can be really, really scary or intimidating uh, to be in court. You may be talking to the judge. It may be your first time ever talking to a judge. Or you may have been in front of a judge before and, and bad things happened. And the judge may say, all right, so you can do $50 a month. And in your mind, you're thinking, no. I told you I couldn't do anything a month and I want community service. You know, you're gonna have to hold your ground a little bit um, and let them know, like, actually, you know, I can't afford to pay anything and I really need community service. Um, so try not to let them talk you into something you can't do um, while being polite and it can be tricky. Um, courtrooms are often, like I said, places that are intimidating and it, it can be tricky when people aren't listening to you um, or you don't know the rules because you're not spending a lot of time in court. So be realistic, be polite, um, and be patient. It may take a while to resolve your tickets and your suspensions. Um, it probably took a while to sort of get into that situation, and it's going to take a little while to get out of. Um, and things are even slower right now uh, because of COVID. Uh, so be patient with yourself and with the process. Um, you may need to get an occupational driver's license, which is that special needs driver's license to drive uh, during this time. Uh, so more information on the occupational driver's license is on the toolkit, as well as, like I said, sample letters so you can ask the court for what you want and a whole bunch of more, a whole bunch more information um, about resolving your unpaid fines and fees uh, and your driver's license suspension. So please use that resource. Um, go there. Um, we'll talk later if you need additional help. There's a, there's a tab on there uh, where you can contact us. Um, or share your story. So please, please use that resource and let us know what works and what doesn't work um, so we can uh, update it as needed. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Carly. And um, thank you and our next presenter for your involvement in the Driven by Debt Houston report and the creation of the Toolkit Texas I mean, Ticket Help Texas. Our next presenter to discuss policy and data recommendations is Mary Mergler. She's an attorney who has worked with Texas Appleseed since 2013. She currently supports Texas Appleseed's criminal justice reform efforts, including ending the use of debtors' prisons, eliminating the criminalization of poverty, and reducing arrests and jail bookings. Prior to joining Appleseed, she worked on criminal justice reform 
at both the Constitutional Project and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Carly. Um, most of this presentation so far has been dedicated to providing you with individualized instructions about how to resolve your own fines and restore your license. I hope you found the advice helpful, um, and I know you probably have more questions, but before we move on to questions, we actually wanna back up from the individual case level and look at this issue from 10,000 feet. We wanna give you a perspective about what we are working on at the state legislature, city councils, and county commissioners courts to address the burden of fines and fees, particularly on lower income people and communities of color. A lot of the problems that we see related to fines and fees are based on the fact that the fine amounts are simply too high for many people to pay. While judges are supposed to take ability to pay into account um, when they're set on, setting a fine, too often they have a standard fine amount that they apply to everyone. And then the court costs plus fees may, as Carly mentioned, may be much more um, than even the fine amount. So while courts can waive those court costs, it doesn't happen very frequently. So a single ticket can end up being several hundred dollars, an amount that many people simply can't afford. And people leave court um, owing an amount that they will really maybe never be able to pay. Many people, uh, maybe some of you listening, have struggled with how to resolve these hefty amounts with limited or no income. While community service and waiver is available, it's often hard for people to learn about these options and understand them, and it can be hard for people to access the court. This may be for practical reasons like lack of transportation or the ability to, to take off work, or it may be fear um, of coming to court. When people don't pay, um, usually because they can't pay, the mechanisms that courts are using to get people to court are not helpful and are in fact counterproductive. Courts mostly rely on the omni holds that Carly discussed on warrants and um, sometimes on vehicle registration holds as well through a program known as the Scoff Law Program. The problem is that an invalid license or vehicle registration just leads to more tickets and mounting debt, making it more difficult to escape this cycle. Warrants and invalid licenses make it more difficult to find a job, uh, to keep a job, to get an apartment, all of which make it less and less likely that a person can actually earn the money to pay off their fines. Next slide, please. We've been researching and working on this problem for, for many years, and um, we've published a report about the issues statewide. Um, more recently, we've published a report about how these issues affect residents in Dallas and Houston specifically. All of these reports have been co-authored with Texas Fair Defense Project. The Houston report was released just earlier this week and many of our attendees are from the Houston area. So I wanna go over that report primarily, but I will say that the problems we uh, see in Houston, we see in courts all across the state as well. They are definitely not limited um, to one geographic region of the state. First off, um, courts issue a huge number of these omni, omni base holds. Statewide, there's about 1.1 million people with omni base holds, and many people have more than one hold. The average is almost four holds per person. In the Houston area, there are nearly 550,000 omni base holds. This is not people, but, but the actual holds. And most of these are coming um, from the Houston Municipal Court, which is a very heavy user of the program. These license holds disproportionately harm people of color. At least 40% are applied to black people who make up less than a quarter, or yes, less than a quarter of Houston's population. And we don't have the data for the Latinx population because they are often recorded as white, but we have every reason to believe that they are overrepresented in the omni base program as well. The reason for these disparities include the fact that Black people are more likely to be stopped and therefore ticketed in Houston, and the racial wealth gap in Houston, uh, as well as across Texas, 
means black people um, earn less than white people on average, so are more um, likely to be unable to pay their tickets. And it's also common sense, uh, but the data does demonstrate conclusively that the Omni-based program in particular hurts lower income communities. There are far more holds in zip codes with higher poverty rates, um, in which a map that I'm about to show um, demonstrates. So this map shows you the city of Houston divided by zip code. The blue shading indicates the average income um, of the zip code. The darker the shading, the lower the average income of, of the zip code. The red dots show the rate of omni-based holds. Larger dots indicate higher rates of holds in that zip code. And it's very clear from the map that, that lower income zip codes have much larger rates of holds. We similarly mapped Omni-based holds in Dallas and the map looked very similar. The lower the average income in a zip code, the higher the rate of Omni-based holds. Next slide, please. The problems with fines and fees are obviously not just limited to this issue of driver's license holds and suspensions. Another major problem is the huge number of warrants that are issued against people simply for not paying traffic tickets. These warrants mean that a person can be stopped and arrested by law enforcement at any time. Nearly 300,000 warrants were issued by the Houston Municipal Court, Harris County Justice Courts and surrounding municipal courts last year in traffic and other fine only cases. Um, statewide, there were more than 2.2 million warrants issued in traffic and fine only cases just last year. Of course, the issuance of warrants means um, arrests and in cities we are seeing thousands of arrests each year for um, these types of warrants and no more serious offense. Um, in 2019, the Houston Police Department arrested more than 6,000 people on Class C warrants and no more serious charge. Just like with Omnibase holds, there are terrible racial disparities in who gets warrants and who is arrested for Class C offenses. Um, for example, approximately three in five of those people arrested for Class C warrants by the Houston Police Department were Black. Also looking at the data, we see that alternative sentences like waiver or in debt reduction um, or community service are very rare. And in most places, they're used in less than 1% of cases. The, the organizations hosting this webinar, as well as many other organizations across the state are working to build a better system and achieve real justice for people, no matter their race or income. And we are doing this by advocating for policy change at the state level and the local level. And we would urge you to join us in this fight. At the state level, um, we are urging the state legislature to repeal the Omnibase program entirely and lift all holds. We will be fighting for legislation to do that this coming session, which, which begins in January. We also want the legislature to require costs and fees to be automatically waived for people who can't afford them. And we need to um, stop the use of warrants for unpaid fines. We will be advocating for legislation that will allow judges to forgive debt in old cases and just close out those cases. If you want to contact your legislators to talk to them about this issue, um, to tell them your story, you can look them up um, at the website that's listed on the slide. The people with the power to get rid of the Omnibase program in this state and make these other changes are your state representative and your state senator. Next slide. The good news is that cities and counties don't have to wait for the state legislature to act to provide relief for people in their own communities who are suffering. Cities and counties can end their participation in the Omnibase program and lift all existing holds. The city of Austin um, City Council voted to do this a couple of months ago. The Harris County Commissioner's Court voted to end their participation just last night. 
The city of Houston needs to do the same. The city of Dallas needs to do the same. All cities, all counties participating in Omnibase should cancel their contracts and lift all holds. Courts also need to make fines more affordable and waive fees and costs. They have the discretion to do this, but it's not happening nearly enough. And courts can re reduce their reliance on warrants and class C cases. Instead, courts can focus on getting people to court by providing them with reminders and clear information, making courts accessible to people and reassuring people they will not be arrested when coming to court. So I would urge you to contact your city council member as well and tell them to stop uh, using the Omnibase program and provide relief for people in your city who are struggling with fines. I've provided a link um, if you're in Houston to find your city council member if you don't know who that is. And um, we'd be happy to help you find that information for any other city as well. So we hope that you'll get involved in these policy reform efforts because particularly if you've been through this system and struggled with these issues, your voice is incredibly powerful. And now I wanna turn it back over to Sarah for um, some concluding remarks and questions. To go to the next slide, please. So here's what you can do. You can sign up to receive alerts about the work that's being done by our organization. You'll see our organization emails at the end of this presentation, but you can also follow us on social media. Again, the, the sponsors for this event was Texas Appleseed, Texas Fair Defense Project, and the Earl Carl Institute. More than anything, you can help effectuate change by sharing your story. You can, sell your, you can share your story specifically by going to this link that's part of the toolkit and entering information. Share the information with community members. Share the report driven by Deb Houston and encourage others to join our campaign. So now we're gonna move on to questions and answers. Do we have any questions? Please um, let me know in the chat box if there are any questions. I'm I seeing. Had, I had I'm a question. Seeing, go ahead. No, I was going to say I had a question for you, and you kind of touched on it on your presentation. But I was wondering uh, what impact and what argument could be made in terms of uh, judges waiving community service due to the coronavirus. So I work, you know, in courts across the state, um, you know, these classy courts, the municipal courts and the justice courts, um, and I am asking judges to do that. Uh, there are some judges who are doing it. Um, it has not really taken off. Um, but I would encourage anyone who is writing a letter to the courts, who is contacting the courts, to include that one of the reasons that they cannot do community service is because we're in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, if you need to include new, news stories um, or things like that, you can. But um, yes, I think that COVID-19 is a hardship to community service, is a reason to ask for a waiver. Um, and I have been asking for it for my clients, um, and I'm hopeful that judges are going to start granting it um, as the pandemic continues. Okay, we have another question. Uh, it says the transportation code says interlock fees can be waived or put on a payment plan. Do you know how this works when the interlock vendors are private businesses? So for folks who don't know, um, an interlock device is like the device you blow into uh, to start your car if you um, have to get that on because of a, a drunk driving offense. Um, this is not an area of law I have expertise in. I know that it does intersect with your driver's license, um, but I, I, can't, I can't answer that question specifically. Um, you have hit the nail on the head that it can be very complicated when the city is telling you to go uh, to a private company who charges a fee um, to do something. Um, 
but yeah, I can't, I can't answer that question specifically. I'm sorry, Jeff, Jeffrey. So um, I, I'll just add to that. I have been told by uh, various district attorney's offices around the state that some of them have um, programs that will help indigent individuals to be able to pay for that and other services connected um, to the version program. Uh, the next question is, what exactly does the city, city of Austin's resignation from Omnibase mean for the, those of us in Austin who are dealing with this issue? So, uh, both as Mary mentioned, the city of Austin and Harris County um, have recently um, terminated their contracts with Omnibase. What that means is, is the courts are no longer going to put people's driver's license into the system. They're no longer going to use the threat of driver's license suspension as an enforcement mechanism for the Austin Municipal Court or the Harris County Justices of the Peace. Um, they're going to lift the holds that exist um, and not put new ones on there. So for the folks who have holds from those places, um, this, is, this is great news. Um, it does not mean that the underlying ticket has been resolved. And so there are parts of this presentation. If you have, you know, a hold on your license that was put there from the city of Austin, um, it will be removed as they, you know, transition out of this program. But at the same time, your tickets are still going to be there. You may still have warrants. Um, you're going to want to contact that court, um, you know, in the mail, through email, uh, set up a time to talk to the judge and resolve those underlying tickets as well. The next question is, does this have any effect on DWI cases? So it, it really doesn't actually. Um, the, the, most of the, the fines and costs we are talking about are class C's. These are fine only offenses, traffic tickets. Um, a handful of other offenses can be fine only like um, being drunk in public or dis disorderly conduct. Um, but the higher level offenses, um, they certainly could be entered into Omnibase if you had court cost from a DWI that you didn't pay, you might end up there, um, but that's gonna be with the county um, and is through a different program. Okay, um, do you have to have a lawyer to help you navigate getting your license back? You don't have to have a lawyer, um, but you also wanna be careful. If you've got a friend or family member um, who has a driver's license suspension and has these tickets, uh, you may want to walk them through the toolkit. You may want to help them run the searches, figure out what's going on, maybe even, you know, work with them to draft these letters. But you can't do it for them and you can't do it without their consent. Um, since you're not a lawyer, you can't practice law. And so you don't want to draft a letter for your son and then mail it to the court. You know, your son needs to do that. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a line, you can provide assistance, um, but you couldn't go to court and represent them. Uh, you couldn't go, if you went with them, say to their hearing in front of the judge, you might be able to go, but you probably can't speak. And so just knowing like there's a difference between a, being a family member, a friend, a supporter, um, and actually practicing law. Mary, I have a question. Yes. So you talked about advocating on um, uh, local and state uh, policy makers. Is there materials, are there, are there materials available for people to help put into context what elected officials are responsible for what types of issues and who, or how best to advocate for these changes? Um, well, the, the reports that we've done um, uh, related to Dallas and Houston um, contain recommendations at the end of the report that are specific to the cities and what cities can do. Um, we also have a report that was published last year that provides sort of a statewide look at this problem. And in that report are um, recommendations that are more focused on the legislature. So looking at that, that list, um, I think will should help um, give people an idea of, of what you know, each governing body can do. Um, and and we're, I'm also happy, you know, if, if people want to reach out over email to ask more specific questions about their city or county or, or um, just, you know, state level reform, I, I'm happy to, to speak with anyone about that. 
Thank you. Um, we have another question. Are there other cities or counties that are getting out of omnibus? The only other city that I'm aware of that had an existing contract and then canceled that contract was Arlington. But in the case of Arlington, if you were already in the system, your hold was not lifted when that contract was canceled. There are cities though um, that don't participate and just never have. Um, Fort Worth is one example, uh, Plano, um, uh, Pasadena, a suburb of, the, the, you know, suburb of, of Houston, um, just they don't issue holds, but um, it, you know, they, it's because they've never entered into a contract with Omnibase. We have another question. How do I get my license? if I owe child support and it says I'm not eligible? So uh, first off, Daniel, I don't know specifically how you would get your license. So I'm gonna speak generally um, about the kind of suspension you're talking about, which is when your driver's license has been suspended uh, for non-payment of child support. This is one of the most difficult uh, suspensions to lift as you probably have experienced. Um, and it has to, you have to get it lifted through the attorney general's office. And so I'm not certain about your specific situation, um, but it involves, you know, getting with the attorney general's office, um, getting right, whatever that means, um, on the child support and getting them to actually lift this hold. Um, this is one, like I said, of, of the hardest holds to lift. Um, so I'm sorry you're going through it, um, but you, you do have to sort of take it up with the AG. Is there any difference in the reinstatement process if someone is trying to get a license for another state, but their suspension is in Texas? So I only practice law in Texas, um, and I don't know. You know, every state has slightly different laws uh, related to driver's licenses and suspensions and holds, uh, and I'm not sure. Some, most of the states communicate with each other. So if your license is suspended in Texas, even if you don't have a driver's license in Texas, which can, you know, kind of seem backwards, they can still do that. Um, the odds are the other state is gonna know about it. And so you'll need to contact the other state directly um, and see what can be worked out. Because everyone's gonna have a little bit different set of, set of ways to deal with that. That is the final question, but I'll take just a moment to invite anyone who wants to get into a last minute question? Who wants to get in a last minute question? I think that's all. I want to thank all of our presenters. Here's the contact information. Please take time and email us your email information if you would like for us to provide you with additional information.